Pediatric Lounge, a podcast taking you behind the door of the Physician's Lounge to get a deeper insight into just what docs are talking about today. From the clinically profound to the wonderfully routine and everything in between. Physician Computer Company. PCC empowers independent pediatricians, streamlining daily operations and improving financial stability. A trusted pediatric partner for 40 years, we offer award-winning support, personalized training, seamless data transitions, and practice analytics. With inclusive pricing, a lively peer community, and a free annual users conference, you can focus on what matters the most, your patients. Explore more at PCC.com. That is PCC.com. Good morning. I got two dear friends of mine, Dr. Barb and Dr. Perry. I've known uh, Dr. Barb for a long time, even though she's moved away. Barbara, thank you so much for joining us today. Oh, it's, it's such a pleasure to be here. So much fun ahead. Thank you. And Perry, how are you today? I'm doing well, Herb. I'm looking forward to this. Thank you for your invitation to be here. I've been eagerly anticipating this whole discussion about uh, a topic that in interests me quite a bit. Barb, if you don't mind sharing, how, how did we meet? It's been a long time ago, but it's... I'll tell you, we met because you're really great at data monetization, uh, but... <laughs> Not, I'm sure, uh, in the way a lot of listeners are thinking about that term at the moment. When my daughter was four years old, we came to your office for care. And the first thing that jumped out at me is that we were electronically inputting our information. We weren't filling out the, the patient forms. And back in 2003, 2004, that was radical. That was not the normal experience. And then when we would subsequently, sadly, we would have to come back a lot because you helped with the care of our children when they were young. So we were seeing you quite often. When we would come back, we would have more and more surprises, delightful surprises in our interactions with your office because we wouldn't have to do what I normally would have to do in, in manual ways. Now, fast forward to today in my research. I actually call that data wrapping, and we'll, we'll get to that later, but it's the use of data in order to delight your customers, in your case, patients, to distinguish you. And one of the reasons why we came back to your office again and again, first and foremost, because you're a great doctor and well, just a happy person, but also because of your experience in your office. And uh, that, that actually adds a lot of value. That's great to know. How is Chris doing, your husband? He's doing great. He's doing great. Yes, because of the work with you, we actually discovered early on that my youngest daughter had Lyme's disease and we were able to overcome that. And through her disease, we ended up realizing that my husband had it too. Instead of having arthritis, he had Lyme's. And again, he was able to overcome that. So yeah, we're, we're grateful for our experience with you for a lot of reasons. I always enjoyed having either one of you in the office. I got my little MBA from both of them. <laughs> We would have a lot of, we would have a lot of business. Yeah, you guys taught me so much about business. It was so much fun to see you and the girls. It, it was a, a very happy time in my life. Now, Perry, how did we meet? So Herb, our paths crossed uh, earlier this year in an unexpected fashion. Uh, you and I were both at a social gathering ho hosted by a mutual friend of ours. That individual works as a radiologist in my former private practice here in Reston. And then you and I got to talking about, of course, when you have a bunch of doctors together, well, we always talk about medicine and healthcare. But then that led to a conversation about non-clinical opportunities for physicians out there, which then led to a conversation about AI and natural language processing. And you and I both discovered that we had a shared uh, interest in uh, learning more about AI, learning about potential use cases for AI in, the sh in shaping the future of uh, healthcare. I'll say his name. My room is a great cook. <laughs> oh, he was a phenomenal cook and a great mixologist. Well, you never too. have a bad meal in his backyard. <laughs> it is a joy to be there. Barbara, catch me up. You moved from UVA where you take teaching the IT master's degree here in Ruston and went to MIT to just purely concentrate on research. So what have you been doing in the last couple of years? I did. Yeah. So I was at UVA, my alma mater. So wahoo wah. I was there for 15 years as a faculty member. And on sabbatical, I went up to MIT to the Sloan School of Management. They have a research center where all that's done in that center is research. 
but it's a very interesting twist. It's a nonprofit for one. So all of the research that we produce is free to the world to help leaders succeed in tech. That's our mission, to help people succeed. I love that mission. Very altruistic, which is important to me. And uh, specifically, my research is to help people succeed, help leaders succeed in data. And so for one, I hope the listeners will go to r.mit.edu and register. Again, all the resources, including healthcare examples and such, are there. But when I went up for sabbatical and I started researching, what I also found interesting was the opportunity to work very closely with people in the trenches, people who are in practice. And in academia, too often we are in ivory towers and what we know is trapped in academic journals and not released to people who actually really need that knowledge. And so what our group does is with practice, we still do academic research that goes off to journal land, but at the same time, we get insights to market immediately through our website deliverables to help. And so long story short, it's been such a joy to have that opportunity that I stayed. I still, of course, am very close with UVA, but now full time, I just conduct research in the topic of data and such. Oh, wonderful. And Perry, you wear a couple of hats, right? I do. Uh, I still practice clinical radiology many hours per week. But a few years ago, I said I, w I was looking to do uh, to use my medical degree and my radiology skills in a different context. And so I went back to get my executive MBA from University of Virginia, Darden. <laughs> and ever since then, I've been doing some, I continue to do clinical work, but I've been doing consulting work on the side, working with various tech companies, startups that are working in the AI space to figure out ways uh, to streamline operations, improve operational efficiency in a process that's inherently very inefficient. There's a lot of work out there being done by companies. And to really appreciate why this is such a, there's so much potential in this field, you have to step back and understand the world of medical imaging as it is right now. Radiology volumes are going through the roof for a variety of reasons, aging population with complex disease, increasing reliance on medical imaging, the sheer number of images per study has increased. When I started training many years ago, a standard CAT scan would have less than 100 images, sometimes 200. But now routinely, CAT scans, MRIs are several thousands of images. So you have this huge amount of volume that grows every single year. And that growth in the volume of work is outpacing the growth in the labor force, right? There aren't enough radiologists entering the labor market to keep up with that tremendous demand. On top of that, radiology workflow inherently has a lot of inefficiencies. So you have this kind of perfect storm. All this is happening in the backdrop of all this new revolutionary technology in AI. And a lot of companies out there are focusing on how can we use existing technology to make what is inherently an inefficient process more efficient. So I've collaborated with teams um, that are working on multiple different projects to figure out ways to empower radiologists to increase their uh, efficiency and ultimately enhance patient care. And having been in the trenches for many years, I know where those pain points are. I experience them every single shift. And they need doctors like us on board to help them understand, okay, when I read a scan, this is what works well, but this is what doesn't work well. And it hasn't worked well for many years. And so these are the pain points we need to fix because they're leading to these bottlenecks. And how can we use AI to, to mitigate these inefficiencies? So you have an advantage because radiology went all digital about 10 years ago, right? The transition has been 20 years, but there are no analog films left. I haven't seen an analog film in, I'd say, 15, 20 years. I, I don't know if Barb knows about this, but back in the day, you take an x-ray and then they take the plate and they go into a dark room and it smelled, it's reeked of chemicals. And then you wait it and then this thing would come out and then you put it up and you read it. That's how, I don't know if you were trained like that, but I was trained like that. Yeah, no, I remember the first half of my residency was we, we were using hard copy films and packs had just come online right in the middle of my residency. And that was, I'd say around 2000, 2001, where we finally started getting digital images. And that was transformative in terms of just not having to just wait for the film to get developed and dry and you know, hang it on the alternator and then bring it down. Plus, those jackets were heavy, too. I don't know, Herb, if you remember how heavy a full patient radiology folder oh, was. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Or trying to find it. They had carousels that were had motors. 
Yep. You know, and I actually think this is a really important point because in the research up at Scissor, we talk about the difference between digitizing and digital. And a lot of times you can't go on to these sexy new opportunities that involve AI, for instance, in digital strategies if you're not first digitized. And I think that's one of the reasons why the healthcare field in general has taken some time to move forward in data monetization. For one, what you just described is movement to being digitized, to even just simply have data to work with. It's the same thing with electronic medical records, right? We had to move as a field to electronic medical records to even have the data digitized so that we can work with it. So I think that's a really important distinction. And now that's one of the reasons why there's so many opportunities today, because we're getting over that hump of, of digitizing. So a radiologist way ahead of the rest of medicine, the electronic medical record is for the most part a failure in that process. Maybe there's hope that it will, with AI and NLP, we will get there, but we're still doing our best to digitize all of this. And it's been a uphill battle. Yes. I was just gonna say the one thing again, just to some simple concepts for people to keep in mind is in the book, we talk about the idea of going from data to insight to action, and then you can get to value creation and realization. When we talk about AI, we're at insight, but we, you can't skip the data. It goes data, insight, action, data. So we have to keep in mind that again, that's great to be so excited about AI, but you have to have that piece ahead of time. And so the more we can connect that digitizing and the data to the insight and the AI, I think the more it will drive interest and commitment to things like electronic medical records. Yes. Barb, what is the goal of data monetization? What are we trying to achieve when you talk about that in your book, which is a phenomenal book? Thank you. Thank you. It's, it's a pretty special effort for me. And this is about 30 years of my research in a book. But, but data monetization, you have to remember, I'm a business professor. And when I was in D.C. for many years directing the master's program, I would have all kinds of organizations, including non-commercial ones. Think of government, nonprofits, defense contractors, as well as commercial companies, medical, different entities that have very strong mission statements around health and such. But as a business professor, my my constant messaging is, I don't care what kind of organization you are. If you want to sustain operations over time, you are a business. <laughs> now, the way your revenues come in may be different. Maybe you're coming, you're getting your revenues from grants or maybe from donors or whatever it is, but you're still an organization where you have to remain economically viable. So that's why it's very important for all organizations, including healthcare entities, to think about data monetization, which is purely, we have data and that's our input. The output of the organization has got to include some kind of financial returns. Otherwise, again, it's just not an, a sustainable effort. And so what's nice about them appreciating this about data monetization is, okay, we have to produce financial returns among other benefits from our data assets. Then what should we be focusing on? So data monetization helps us really focus on what matters to our organization, what we care about. And there's a lot of opportunities we, which we can get into for sure, but we got to think it like a business when we're in the medical field. So Perry alluded to that first step in radiology, the digitizing of films caught a lot of human capital out of the equation and inefficiencies, allowing the radiologist to be faster at reading films, higher throughput, which makes the patient happier because the, the less time you're waiting for the radiologist to read your ankle x-ray in the ER, the faster you get out of the ER and that makes the patient happier. But it also allows you to diagnose critical things faster and start treating. So that was a big win. So we've been, we saw that there. I'm not so sure we're there in pediatrics yet. I think we're still pretty far behind. Yeah. If, if we oh, just real good, yes. we had to sit and come up with use cases in the medical field. We could come up with easily just the three of us doing a quick brainstorming, probably hundreds in each space. The opportunities are pretty tremendous. And and just one quick example, uh, one of the facets of healthcare I've studied now for close to thirty years actually is the medical spend 
space. Um, it started with a case study I did on Owens and Minor back in the late 90s in their idea of having information about how much people, how much hospitals were paying for medical uh, supplies and making that transparent. And as they digitized the distribution channel, the supply chain, basically from manufacturers to hospitals, illuminating what used to be very opaque, all of a sudden there was this realization that, oh my goodness, in this hospital, we're paying $700 for an orthopedic screw over here. And for that same screw on this side of the organization, we're paying $1,700. It's crazy. And so just making transparent some of our core processes in healthcare, it is amazing then how we can remediate inefficiencies, for instance, or, or poor work practices. And so the first step is measuring. And that's sometimes easier said than done. So we have a mastermind group and we use Tableau to measure. We're only at financial performance of pediatric practices. But in order to be able to, from one CRM, to be able to look at the different KPIs that the owner of a practice needs to know, I have to pull four different data sets and then put them in a visual. That's what you describe in your book. That's the first step of data, right? It's just bringing all that data together and putting it in a way that people can read it. And, and actually, I like to distinguish data from data assets. Data is okay. everywhere. It's like water. Even though water is everywhere, I'm not going to go outside to the lake and take a drink of it. I'm going to go to the water sources that I know are curated to be drank safely. Same thing with data. And there's data all over the place. It's not impressive, in my opinion. What's impressive are, are, is data that's purposely created into assets that are teed up for use. So in your example, Herb, if you have, and we would want to have a very focused objective, what kind of outcome do we want to create from this data? And then how do we then put a created data asset that can recurringly be used in order to generate that output. And so that's really what a lot of organizations in our research are focusing on today is what are the assets that matter? And starting with one or two. And a quick example, we have a retailer who they have convenience stores all across South America, a lot of them. And their data asset that they started with is called dead net profit. And in all it is, it's a big deal. It's skew level profitability for any product that they sell across their convenience stores. And once they have that, then all of a sudden you have the store operations able to set the appropriate store hours per store. You have sales and marketing able to put together the right advertising. You have supply chain able to negotiate the right prices. So it's the same thing for pediatricians. It's what are those at, at initially the, the really core questions that need to be answered because of the, the levers that you, that you need to manage? And then how do we create a data asset that recurringly can help us monitor and be used for that? And then we can move on from there. Yes. So having talked to you and Chris for a long time, I, I don't think that any business survives without revenue. So I think that when you start looking at data, you have to look at revenue first and maximize the margins. Not quality is extremely important, but if you don't have revenue, doesn't you could be the, the most talented radiologist or pediatrician in the world. If there's no money for rent and paying staff, you don't get to see patients, you don't get to use skill. Exactly um, right. And, and it doesn't have to come in through saying, through, through charges or even reimbursing. It could come in, for instance, from a grant or some kind of donor stream that still is money in. Yeah. So you have to think thoughtfully about the different ways in which you can um, create capital for use for whatever your operation is. So as I was reading your book, and when you create data assets, and you, it's beautifully segmented into the different things that happen in the journey of data management. But the first step is you, you have an asset you can use. You have someone that can present it to the person that makes the decisions, the easy money is improving efficiencies to improve your margins. And that's where I think is the first step in 
internal medicine, pediatrics, family practice. Now, Perry's working on that from a different end, which is using natural language processing to build data models so that the radiologist can have a summary of all past studies and be more efficient as they read more films. How is that journey going for you, Perry? Barbara, first of all, I love that term data asset. And just for the sake of consistency, I want to make sure I'm using the term correctly in the context of medical imaging. Would it be inaccurate for me, for us to call data-driven AI software a data asset? So the data running it? Yes, exactly right. So if you think about all the different sources that potentially are being drawn in order to um, fuel what you're doing, the data sources would be the data. And then after the processing happens and after it's in a state to then feed whatever the application is that you're moving with, that's the asset state. So the idea it's, and we use the term data liquidity for data assets, which has really resonated and data liquidity is the ease of use and even the ease of reuse, because ideally you establish a data asset for this particular purpose. And then if acceptable, since you've put a lot of work into creating that asset, maybe it's used for other purposes in healthcare. Again, as long as acceptable data use is a key capability, because that has to do with the appropriate use, the legal use, compliant use, ethical use of that data. But if all of the, the checks are checked off in terms of, of that use, then hopefully we can reuse and, and recombine those data assets across the organization. Herb, your question was, how do we use AI and data monetization in radiology? Is that correct? Uh, I was more interested in how you're starting to explore natural language uh, processing and models. To improve efficiency. To improve efficiency. As we were talking about earlier, uh, a lot of the work we do is broken up into radiologists. We have two components, basically. We have a visual component of our work and then a text-based component. The visual component uh, is self-explanatory. We look at MRI scans, review CT scans, et cetera. And the text component is uh, we review prior radiology reports. If if available, we'll review prior medical records before interpreting the current scan. And then we generate a text output in the form of a radiology report. So both the visual part and the text-based part, there are uh, very tedious components to it that uh, can be easily outsourced to AI. For example, on the visual side, the measuring. Whenever we see uh, a nodule or a tumor, we have to provide measurements for the surgeon or the radiation oncologist. Is that hard to do? Not really, <laughs> but it's very tedious, requires. And I was curious when I, before this discussion, I said, let me see exactly how many mouse clicks are required to measure one tumor. And I was surprised because I just do it mindlessly. It's like second nature at this point. It's 16 to 18 click drag sequences to measure one tumor in three dimensions. So you imagine, oh, how much time it takes for five tumors in somebody's brain or their lungs or their liver, et cetera. It's tremendously inefficient. So that can easily be outsourced to AI. But now back to your question about NLP. So the text component of our job also has similar very tedious, mundane, uh, labor-intensive things that can be outsourced to uh, NLP and AI uh, software, for example, based at things like spell check, editing, correcting mistakes, all the right-left discrepancies. Sometimes radiologists find mistakes, say, in the body of the report, they'll say right renal cyst, but then in the impression, in the conclusion, it says right ovarian cyst. And there's confusion. Patients are male, but then why does the radiologist say that there's a cyst in the ovary? All that stuff takes time to make sure those things don't uh, slip through the text, the cracks in the system. But it's not that hard. It's just labor-intensive and very tedious. We use NLP. There are applications now to do all that and take care of all that tedium. But there are also more complex tasks that that one radiologist can't do well at the level they'd want to do because time is an issue, right? And that goes back to a summary of text. Sometimes, depending on the kind of case I'm looking at and how complex the patient is, uh, how many body parts are being imaged, how many prior exams have been done on that patient, I'll spend, you know, upwards of 10, 12 minutes sometimes reading prior reports before even viewing the first image on today's scan because I want to get an accurate picture of what all the previous radiologists have said before me. Because as radiologists, it's embarrassing when you don't comment on something one of your colleagues noted last last month or six months ago. Because then invariably, if you don't address that suspicious finding that somebody mentioned back two years ago on a CAT scan, you'll get a call from the doctor or the patient saying, hey, by the way, you looked at a scan 
the other day, but you made no mention of that nodule that was there in the patient's lung on the scan from two years ago. A lot of that happens just because we just don't have time to sift through all those text reports and find that one sentence where the radiologist two years ago said, oh, there's a suspicious two millimeter nodule in the right lung. So having NLP-based tools and large language models to go through that large volume of text, spit out a nice, accurate summary consistently, would be revolutionary in terms of helping streamline our workflow. It takes the emphasis away from spending all that time just reading through text. And a lot of these companies, they want to maximize eyes on screen time. Right, they want to keep radiologists' eyes focused on the images because that's ultimately the most important thing. We have to make sure we detect all the abnormalities. We don't miss any abnormalities. Uh, in order for us to keep our eyes on the screen as much as possible, we need to have all those other. And in your book, Barb, you would describe this as the most advanced form of data science. I think so, you... so for, for data, well, this would be called improving, where okay. we're using our data in order to make uh, work better, cheaper, faster. And okay. so clearly when it comes to reading in the radiology world, making these processes better, cheaper, faster, this is a classic case of what we call improving with data. And if you think about returns and financial returns to really feed back to our missions and what we're intending to do, improving represents about 51% of the returns that we get from our data. And so you think okay. about, we want to make sure that our doctors are, are doing high, high value add work. And if we can have our systems help when we have very complex tasks and when we have tasks that have a lot of non-value add components, we can offset that and really work with the data. That's a big win. And a lot of financial benefits, which we can funnel back into other parts of our organizational businesses. You, you walk the reader in your book through the data value creation process. Yeah. Yeah. Let, let's talk about that a little bit because ADD. To me, there's no purpose of doing anything if movement is not involved. Yeah. So it's not about the data. First of all, it's not about the data. We need to take data though. Data has to be our source. So we can't forget that we need data. So going back to before, we can't just start with deriving insight. What are we deriving insight from? We start with data and then we have to move to insight. So we have some kind of anomaly that we've just detected through our, the, the, the radiology process or reading these, reading scripts and such, and then moving to action. So what are we going to do because of what we now know? But then even forward, it's not just about taking action. We want to make sure that there's value uh, creation that's happening, better health. We want to more quickly get to patients, whatever they need for remediation, and then ultimately, we need value realization, which is mission fulfillment, but really some kind of financial returns from what's going on. So maybe we have less medical costs involved because we've detected something sooner. And so there's less, again, cost of remediation that we have to incur and such. So this idea of moving from data, insight, action, value creation, value realization, that whole process has to happen for data monetization to occur. And so that's why we want to pick, pick our focus. We don't want to just have data everywhere and just lying around. I mean, we want to put our, our data to work through that entire process. We also don't want to stop at insight, for instance. Okay, great. We just learned that a patient has a high probability of some kind of um, serious condition. We don't just stop there and we want to take some action in order to again create and then realize value. So that's the whole process that we want to think through as we are considering different ways of really putting our data to work. So in the action component, if I read your book correctly, there's two ways. One, one is through coaching, right? That's the best way of getting people to do things. Hold them accountable, meet next week and see if you met your goals or not. That's basic management. Even better is when you can automate that action. Yeah, yeah. The more you can ensure that the entire data insight, action, value creation, realization, the more you can make sure it all happens, then you can get to action. A lot of times, let's just take, for instance, a, a healthcare example. If we have, and this is an actual case we did in a hospital where 
there was, we would take the, the electronic medical record data and we were able to predict. So we had an insight of the likelihood of a patient fall. So we're in a hospital setting. We know which of the hospital patients have a high likelihood of fall. Okay, this is all great. So what? If we stop there. So, so we know that some people have a really high likelihood low. Okay. Then we have to take some action, which would be really setting up a context within the hospital where there are ways to first detect when a person with a high likelihood to fall is getting out of bed. And then how do we make sure that we find the right staff in order to respond? And how quickly do they have to respond? And you can just imagine, go on and on, on all of the change management and all of the process changes that have to happen in that hospital setting to put that insight of here's a patient with a high likelihood of falling who's about to get out of bed and to actually remediate an action. And then, of course, the value creation, if we move all the way through, is we want to get to the point of making sure um, our patient doesn't fall. <laughs> so we have an increase in patient health of those who are engaged in our hospital. And then value realization hopefully would be things like lower fall rates, lower hospital costs, because we're getting people out because we're not keeping them longer since they just fell. But <laughs> you can imagine uh, reimbursement. So we want to be thinking all the way through to value realization, which is a benefit for all, for the right. patient as well as um, the hospital itself. BCC empowers independent pediatricians, streamlining daily operations and improving financial stability. A trusted pediatric partner for 40 plus years, we offer award-winning support, personalized training, seamless data transitions, and practice analytics. With inclusive pricing, a lively peer community, and a free annual users conference, you can focus on what matters the most, your patients. Explore more at pcc.com, pcc.com. And in medicine, it's not just the money. The fact that patient didn't fall, didn't end up with a hip replacement in a nursing home for eight weeks, it's a life-changing quality of life for that patient. So a lot of what we do is not just money. It's the return on investment is not just dollars and cents. It's quality of life, or in some cases, you stay alive. Um, and I would argue that's your first mission. And keep yeah. that mission, please, especially as a patient. But keep yes, that mission, yeah, right? Yeah. That being said, we need to sustain. And so if we have a poorly run setting that is saving patients' lives, but yet isn't sustained and goes out of business next year, then that's not going to make me happy. anybody. Yeah. Exactly right. And so we need to, as we save patient lives in this particular instance, also making sure that we're doing it in a way that's sustainable, meaning attracting more funding. Maybe we are um, pleasing donors of a hospital so well, so we're getting more uh, donations coming in. That's also a source of revenue, right? It doesn't have to be the, the, the price of care, for instance. And so um, these, this is the way we need to think in terms of long-term viability of the settings that we're establishing. And Perry, in radiology, you're fairly far advanced, right? That the, the AI models can now read complex MRIs and CT scans and bring up to the top the ones that have critical abnormalities that the radiologist needs to review before the normal ones? Yeah, absolutely. I think that's a good example of how data and the technology around it can add value in non-monetary ways, for example, for the patient. So what you described right there is a situation, is an AI application which pre-screens through a whole list of, of scans that are sitting on my queue, for example, or any radiologist queue and says it, it recognizes something that may be a life-threatening critical finding that needs to be brought to the doctor's attention as soon as possible. And it'll automatically bump that to the top of the queues and kind of flag saying, hey, Perry, you may want to look at this next head CT as soon as possible because there is a subarachnoid hemorrhage on it. And the neurosurgeon probably wants to know about that sooner rather than later. Because the current workflow, we read in order of uh, when the cases land on our queue. And I may have 25 cases on my queue, and that 23rd case may be the one that's a critical finding that needs to be read next if we don't have any assistance in, in terms of AI to help bump that case up on, in priority. That patient could just be sitting there for an hour and a half with no diagnosis 
So yeah, so absolutely, there's an, that, that's value created for both the radiologist and the patient with a relatively simple solution, just case prioritization. And that's just an example for intracranial hemorrhage. They have similar applications for pneumothorax, aortic dissection, pulmonary embolism. So the list goes on and on in terms of use cases for that one simple thing, case prioritization. How many cases can you bump up to the top of the radiologist's work list to save lives? So that would be a good example of presenting the data and then the machine prompts the action and it creates great value. Barb, yep. that's what we, that's the holy grail there, right? That's what we want the system to do. The person, the human is working to the top of their capacity and the machines are trying to add value to it and decrease the, what I call repetitive stress injury, where the clicks and the flipping through pages and reading the normals first until you get to the last one, which is grossly abnormal. Then in your book, you go from there, there's three steps to, to data monetization. The second step is wrapping. Yeah. And so then, yes, go ahead. I was going to say, so we, you know, can, although we can come up with a million different ways to use data in the field of healthcare, conceptually, there are three different ways to convert data into money in a positive way. The one is what we just talked about. We can improve work. We can make work better, cheaper, faster. The second thing we can do is we can create value add features, experiences. Think about we're using data analytics to improve our offering. So in this case, instead of making work cheaper, better, faster, we are encouraging whoever we're serving to pay more, stay longer, a new, we want to acquire new patients if that's who our, our customer is. And so, Herb, I would argue that you are great at data wrapping. <laughs> and, so, and I really believe that because if you think about as a patient, for me with my daughters, when we came to your office back in the day, and if I had to look across different pediatrician experiences, the question, is there data analytics feature or experience that distinguishes you specifically that delighted me more than others? And your use of data at the time absolutely distinguished you because I would come in and instead of having to fill out the same darn form by hand every single time, which still drives me crazy when I have to do it, you had us go up to a computer and we would put in our name and all of our information would already be in there. And all I had to do is confirm it. Now, fast forward to today, that's, that's out there. But back then, it was not. Was and it. so that distinguished your office. And so as a consumer, if you will, of pediatric services, when I had to choose which doctor to see, hands down, I went to you because the experience delighted me. And I, it made me feel more comfortable. And I just felt like you knew what was necessary for the care of my family because of the way you were using data and, and sharing that back. So that's what we call data wrapping. It's how can you use data analytics in whatever offering you're providing? In your case, it's pediatric services. How to use it in order to, again, help a patient or help a customer acquire better use or better create value from your services. Thank you. So I think for me, I am very data driven, but for me, it started more. Hello. And so for me, it started more at looking at the customer journey. Yes. Yes. And, and I figured that in the neighborhood that we live in, most everybody, mom and mom or dad or mom and dad work. And there's nothing more frustrating than being put on hold for 30 minutes where you got other stuff to do. And the daycare is, you got to take your daughter to the doctor because she spiked a fever. And so I said, I can order a plane ticket at two in the morning to go anywhere in the world and I don't have to touch a human. And that to me is a much more complex transaction. How can it be that people can't just say, I got to see the doctor at six o'clock today after I pick up Jenny from the daycare. And I just can't do that online without talking to a human. I got my appointment. I'm in. I'm done. And my anxiety level is down. I know that the problem is going to get solved, not at two in the afternoon, but it'll get solved at six. That's great. 
And that was my idea that to eliminate barriers for parents to actually be able to soothe their anxiety and know that they could be taken care of during that same day. For data wrapping. I, I understand. You, you really will because that helps. So as a customer, as a parent with a child in your practice, by setting up that type of capability that let me better acquire your services. So how can data analytics let us, again, acquire, use, or add value from your offering? And that absolutely helped with me getting in to see you for my children. So that was a huge value add. So that would be a great example of data wrapping. Well, it's very frustrating because of HIPAA and all the regulations. It is not easy to find a practice that will allow you to schedule your own appointment. The technology is all there, but they don't want to. They just, they're afraid of the liability. What if the person with a headache that has a, a growing subdural hemorrhage picks a, a CT scan for six weeks from today, and by the, when they get here, they're dead? You know what? That same person might never make the call either. They're going to be dead. But there are other uses, I think, for data wrapping, for example, in radiology, Really, the only thing that radiologists do that's preventive care is mammograms. And so if you're able to remind the patient to come in for their mammogram, make it easy so that they don't have to, there's very little friction. And in addition to that, not only be ready to do the mammogram, but if something's abnormal, to cue them right into an ultrasound and cue the biopsy that same day, if at all possible, that so much decreases the anxiety that woman's going to have when she has dense breast tissue and we're not sure, come back in two weeks for the ultrasound. Dear God, if someone had told me I had cancer, I got to wait two weeks, I'd be dead from the scotch I was drinking before I get the second exam. It's just, it generates a lot of anxiety. And what holds us back there, I think, and correct me if I'm wrong, Perry, but it's the HIPAA. It's just, Everybody's concerned about the HIPAA and the lawyers suing us if we open that door. No, I'm, Herb, you're absolutely right. The technology is there. It's been proven in so many other industries. It's no different in healthcare, but there are so many unique hurdles and obstacles that we all have to deal with because of HIPAA, because of security, legitimately. But that, I think, is one of the key reasons why a lot of these innovations haven't really gained as much traction in medicine which is really unfortunate, right? We were in the business of taking care of people and saving lives and extending life, but all this red tape just really stifles the rapid adoption of stuff that's been adopted by other industries years ago. Yeah, That's well, frustrating. I think, I think one of the hopes with, so my book, it's called Data is Everybody's Business, and that title was purposeful. It was to make anybody feel like the concepts of data monetization or the conversion of data into returns, that it's a topic that anyone can absorb and apply. And so the more we start level setting an understanding of this concept, which is neither good nor bad, it's a neutral term. It's just, this, it, it's a thing that we all have to become educated about because of the proliferation of data. But even in the legal world and in the government world, we need everybody to really understand this so we can make some changes to for instance, legislation and some of our, our regulatory requirements so that we really can um, create the benefits that we should be from these advancements. Uh, absolutely. And then on, on, the on, the, on, the, on the section of data wrapping, you talk about the four A's. Yes. What are the four A's, which is a very important concept for anybody in business, but more than trying to monetize data? When digital started becoming a thing, when you started having all of these digital companies, and when I say digital companies, kind of web-only kinds of organizations and such, then traditional organizations, a hospital, a, a practice, um, thought, oh, we can come up with digital features too. We have a website. Let's like offer stuff. And the problem is that not everything we do in technology necessarily results in value creation, much less value realization. And what the four A's are, are like a little bit of a checklist to help us think about what we're going to create digitally, whether it be reports or alerts or features or websites or whatever it is that actually is going to result in value creation and realization. So for instance, 
the example I always like to give is back in the early days when banks, their first kind of foray into the space of wrapping was to give people their spend breakouts. You get a pie chart. I don't know if you've had this with your bank, but again, first thing you get a pie chart is shows how much you spent. And so at first I was like, oh my gosh, this is so exciting. I can see a pie chart of my spend. And then you start thinking about it. And you're like, okay, so what do I do with this? <laughs> like what? Is, and the whole point of data wrapping is you want your, whoever you're caring for, whether it be a patient, a customer, you want them to create, feel value. They need to realize value then for them to spend more, pay more, stay with you longer. You have to have incentivized in some way. So if you think about the four A's, you think about a feature like a pie chart of your spend, does that help the person anticipate? Not really. It's like a backward, like a backward on, on what you spent. Does it help a banking customer adapt? Maybe I can look at my breakout and maybe adapt to my spending going forward in some way because I'm not comfortable with how much I'm spending on groceries or, or, or something like that. Act. Does it inspire action? Again, if I'm just looking at a breakout of my spend, doesn't necessarily have to act. Anyway, so the bottom line is when you are coming up with data wraps, we, we say features, experiences for your practice, you want to use these four A's as a checklist to really understand is this really something that's going to be added value for whoever I'm serving? And so for you, going back to your practice, Herb, and things like going in and pre-filling out forms that I normally would have to do on my own, that would basically anticipate potentially in terms of what I'm there for and what I need to complete. It definitely is adaptive because you're adapting the content to me as this is my information, not somebody else's that I'm not. You can see how the four A's, yes. right? And so it's a nice little checklist to, and, and this has been empirically validated showing that the higher you would rate on the four A's, the more useful and engaging of a feature it will be for whoever you're serving. And then our research has gone on to say, and that will actually inspire a lift in selling more paying more, new acquisition, retention, those types of customer metrics. So it seemed to me this is very similar for the three A's, right? Availability and availability. And not only should you judge data monetization, but even your management style by these four A's. That's a lot of A's. But well, you should, right? You should try to anticipate what headwinds are coming to your business adapt, take action, and assess if the action achieved the desired result. And if you're constantly thinking of your business in that way, perhaps it'll be more profitable than the other businesses in town. And when Perry's working as a consultant with these companies, is this helping the radiologists anticipate, adapt, take action, and get better results from a UX experience that is something that builds value for his customer, which means you should get better margins for the company. And that was, I really liked those terms that you put in there. I'm going to wrap it up with a little bit of how you break up stuff because I liked it. So you said there's five data management capabilities. Number one is data management. And to me, that's just like the foundation. That's what we were talking about before, Perry, with in terms of there's one thing to get into insight and using AI, but you have to have the data in order to feed that. So if the data is bad, then you're at a standstill. You're really not going to get very far if you don't have the right data underlying what you're trying to do with AI. And then there's a data platform. And what is the data platform in that chart? Data, data platform is you have to have the data on a, in technology that makes it cost efficient to serve up that data, not only inside, but outside of the firm. Think about things like patient portals today, where you have to potentially release to your patients and such. And so a platform is really important. Think about potentially running analysis on an Excel spreadsheet on a single computer in a doctor's office. That's really tough to scale or to do anything with if an insight is produced. And so today having platforms that we can tap into, systems, that's really important for us to at scale start creating value with the data that we're 
analyzing. So I had to laugh when I was reading your book because you say the Byzantine spreadsheets and pivot tables, which you're is, not alone, which is like what 95% of physicians are using to try to figure out where their business is going and who do they need to reach out to, to bring back to improve quality of patient care. And that's just so far back. And then the third uh, thing is that the data science, which was Perry was alluding to where in radiology, they're actually now using AI to improve not only the quality, the margins, but the radiologists being in a sense, right? They're not bogged down with repetitive stuff that doesn't bring value. A machine can do that and they can concentrate on the higher thinking, the higher order stuff. That is where all the value lies. And I think that's huge value. Herb, everyone's talking about physician burnout, people leaving the professions because they just can't do all this tedium anymore. Think about if you can tell a radiologist, look, we'll get you through your cases faster so you can get back to your family earlier in the day. Once you get home, you're not going to be charting or documenting stuff during family time. Talk about tremendous value right there. And you improve patient, uh, um, you improve physician morale, satisfaction. That's huge. Yeah. Yeah. From the more of a clinician point of view, right? One of the biggest drawbacks to chars is that it has separated me from the patient. There's so many clicks and your nose is stuck to the screen and you don't have a conversation with the families anymore. And if you do, then you're burdened with st- spending an hour or two filling in charts. Mm-hmm. And the patient doesn't benefit from that. The doctor doesn't benefit from it. Over 50% of what's in EHRs today is garbage. It's just templated clicks and it's somewhere in the little blurb. I actually write, Johnny's got an ear infection on the left ear. Not, does not look severe. He's not toxic. I want to see him back in two weeks. All the other fillers. If there was a way that we could use what you're doing in radiology, but this gets in the weeds. So the way the EHR was designed, there's so much structured data. And some of the narrative fields can be accessed easily, that it's hard to do that data review by a machine. But if we could think of it more if, as if you know, I was a lawyer and I'm writing in my yellow pad what Barbara's telling me about what the company's problem is, taking notes, and then the AI takes my data and what's in the, what's in the file and then write, helps me write a letter to Barb about what I'm recommending that she does. That, that's where we need to move to, but we're far from that in the clinical space. And that yellow pad remains in there for me to look at the note next time, because that's really what I'm thinking. The all formatted note with dear Dr. Wixom and hope this letter finds you well, and don't hesitate to call us back. Our law firm's here to serve you. That's, that's fluff. I, I don't need to read that every time she comes in, right? I need to remember what we talked about and what her strategy was. But we're far from that in the HR. And then I think this was also genius. You, you, you talked to about it in your book, which is every organization needs to be customer focused. At the end of the day, we're here to understand the customer's journey and take out the pain points. Because the more you like me, the more money I make. And even if I don't care about the money, the more kids I get to make feel better. But if I don't understand your journey and I just want to do it the way I like it, then you're not going to give me the opportunity to take care of your kids. And, but I loved it that you put that in the book about data because people forget at the end of the day. What do we want to do with all this data is we, we want to do our jobs better. And my job is to take care of kids. So I want to see more kids and do it better and make the parents happy. I want to be able to make the kids happy, but as long as the parents happy with the results, I call it a win. Right. Yeah. And then five was very interesting for us. It's very complicated, but acceptable use of data is very important. Yeah, for us, it's very, all the laws and all the stuff makes it very difficult. And any closing thoughts, Perry? What do you think about this conversation? 
No, I think it's, uh, as we were talking, I was trying to think of examples of rapping in radiology. And I think I'm realizing that we're, we're rapping without even realizing that we're rapping things. For example, Barbara, you're talking uh, in your book uh, and in the Data Viz podcast about that increased credit card usage when the customers realize that the value that they're getting was protection from fraud, right? And so that got me thinking about cases in radiology. So, for example, oftentimes as radiologists, we'll recommend a follow-up scan in three months, six months, because we see something a little fishy. We're not convinced that it needs to be biopsied or removed surgically. The safest thing to do, and we don't, feel com- we don't feel comfortable dismissing it completely, we just say, well, let's take a look again in six months, come back for another repeat scan. But studies have shown that a lot of those patients don't come back for the follow-up for a variety of reasons, either the doctor didn't get the report or the patient was unaware or the patient was aware and they tried to call scheduling but got tired of waiting for 45 minutes to schedule the exam. Regardless, a significant percentage of those patients never come back for follow-up. And it's problematic for a bunch of reasons. From a business standpoint, those are lost revenues. But more importantly, it's suboptimal patient care. And potentially, you have, you're losing an opportunity to mitigate costs by catching an abnormality earlier in its progression than waiting until the patient has advanced metastatic lung disease, which requires millions of dollars of care, surgery, radiation, chemotherapy, et cetera. But so what um, they've done, some companies out there are working on pouring through the data and figuring and just even go back to natural language processing and large language models, using that technology to, to go through hundreds, thousands of patient reports and pull out the ones that need the follow-up. And then contact and streamline the process, automated so that those patients get text messages, emails saying, hey, by the way, your doctor recommended follow-up in three months. It's been two months. You haven't scheduled yet. Click on this link and we'll get you scheduled right away. So that, I thought the parallel is to- wrap. Yeah, that's, that's a wrap. That's a wrap, right? Because that's a good wrap. wrap. And, and, it anticipates, and so, it acts. That's a great wrap. And so your credit card customers were feeling that level of protection from fraud. These patients are now feeling that level of protection. Okay, if I stay with this health system or keep going to this radiology practice for my scans, nothing's going to slip through the cracks. If I forget, somebody's got my back and they're going to remind me. So I said, wow, that's a, that's a classic wrap. Yes. That's, that's a great example. That's a great example. What are your, what, any closing thoughts, Barb? You, you're, yeah. you have a phenomenal mind and you're looking at industry for a whole other level, right? And it's such a diversity of industry. What are your yeah, I've, I've been looking at this for a long time. I back in the I remember working with the Health and Human Services back in the day when they had data palooza. This was back, oh gosh, I don't even know when that started years and years ago. I I think my my big message is that data doesn't have to be hard. And that whatever type of organization you're a part of, you just need to think about what's your biggest pain in terms of improving. What's your biggest pain? Is it associated with reimbursement? Is it your cost structure? Is it the way in which you're acquiring patients? What is that? And pick a focus and think about how can data and then moving from data to insight to action can value create in that particular space to really make a big difference. Or for wrapping, if you think about who you're serving, how can you become more useful and engaging to whoever you're serving? to help them better either acquire, use, or create value from your services. And just starting there with one use case example in either way can start moving you forward in your practice, in your organization. And then all of a sudden you've built, you've learned. And that's a lot of this is organizational learning. It's we've learned and now we can build on that. Now we can actually showcase what we've done to others to start building motivation for people to to get on board and help move forward. So that's we have to start that snowball and then push it down the hill, right? So that we are really making a difference in the healthcare space because I know I for one, I want the healthcare space to succeed. We need you. Everybody wants you. Anyway, our stuff can help. Anyway, data can help. I want to be a part of that. So what I hear you saying is you don't have to be IBM or Apple or Google to start using data to delight your customer or be more efficient. Yep. And a small project is just fine. It's actually encouraged. It will demystify. Yeah. I hope it will demystify what moving from data insight action to value is all about. And I hope it is empowering to have some transparency about what this is, what this means 
so that more and more people and more and more leaders in medicine and healthcare can, again, move us, move the field forward. Great. And so neither one of you thinks that we're all going to be out of jobs in five years because of chatbot. We're going to get busier. We're all going to get I think we're fine. <laughs> I think we will need more computers. It's been a phenomenal hour with both of you. I greatly admire what both of you do. And I always like having conversations with you guys. So anytime you want to return and talk about something, I really would greatly, I greatly appreciate the opportunity to have another conversation. It was a pleasure. Yeah. I enjoyed being here. I'd love it. Love In the it. meantime, we'll put Dr. Wixom's book on the show notes. And I highly encourage you to read it because I think it's very well written with a lot of experience, but it really takes your fear away of approaching data as another tool that it can improve your business processes. And so many people are afraid of the data that losing that fear is the first step and is a very important first step to improve your organization. Have a wonderful day. Let me as well. Thank you for listening. This has been a production of the Pediatric Lounge. On the show notes, you will find links to our co-host and other important notes as well as a timetable of the topics discussed today. Don't forget to follow us on social media and subscribe to wherever you listen to your podcast. Leave us a great review as it helps us greatly. In the meantime, we will see you next week. The Pediatric Lounge. The conversations are not intended as medical advice and the opinions expressed are solely those of the host and the guests.